Good. So uh, thank you for joining us. It is great to have you here. Uh, my name is Jeff Harmoning, and I'm the chairman and CEO of General Mills. And uh, we are excited to be back at the Aspen Ideas Festival again this year. I'll, let me, I'll give you a little bit of context, and then I'm going to get out of the way and let the panel do their, do their thing. And it should be really interesting. So General Mills is a 150-year-old company, born on the banks of the Mississippi River in 1866. But you most likely know us through our brands. We have $8 billion brands. Um, Things like Cheerios and Yoplait, Betty Crocker, Pillsbury, Old El Paso, Progresso, Gold Medal Flower. These are the General Mills brands, as well as Blue Buffalo, which we'll talk about here today. About 20 years ago, we saw a, a shift in, uh, in consumer interest to more natural and organic products. And 20 years ago, General Mills didn't have anything that was natural and organic. And now, uh, now we're the second largest producer of natural <laughs> and organic products in the United States. Brands like Annie's and Lara Bar and Epic and Cascadian Farm and Muir Glen and now Blue Buffalo. Um, so today, um, consumers see tre uh, treating pets as a true member of the family. There is no question about that. For all of you who are pet owners, as I am, um, we all feel that way. So last year, General Mills brought Blue Buffalo uh, into the family because we want to. We really feed family members at General Mills. And now we're not only feeding the human members, but also the furry ones. And so we're excited to be a part of this discussion today. Uh, pets play a big role in many people's lives. They certainly do in my life. And so uh, as they do for many of our employees and many of you. So I think uh, up on the screen, I'd like to introduce you to Fox. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, Fox is a King Charles Cavalier uh, Spaniel who loves to be loved. Aww. We picked him up in Switzerland and uh, when, we were, when we were living there. And... Uh, we bought him when he was two years old, and all his commands are in French and Polish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they, they still are. And uh, people always ask me, that you, I'm, I'm not kidding you, they say, um, so does Fox speak French? I'm like, uh, oui. no. Uh -huh. No, he doesn't speak, he didn't really speak any language. He's, <laughs> he's short on words and long on tail wags. So, so there's Fox. What I'd like to do now is, is introduce you to... Uh, to Natalie Morales, and I'm not really sure that I need to because I'm sure that most of you know her already. But Natalie is the is the West Coast anchor of NPC's Today Show and a host of the Dateline and syndication. Um, she is a very accomplished journalist, as you well know, who has reported for Today for 13 years. Is also the author of At Home with Natalie and the proud owner of a couple of rescue <laughs> dogs, who maybe she'll introduce yeah. here in a minute. And without further ado. Um, Please welcome uh, Natalie Morales. Thank you, Jeff. Come on in, folks. Grab a seat. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I know this is a topic that you all love equally as I do. This is one when they asked me to do this. I said, absolutely. Talk about my pets all day. I pretty much do that anyway. So why not come out to Aspen and do it here? Uh, I'm the proud owner and proud mom, fur mom, of two beautiful rescues. They happen to both be on shows whether it was the Today Show and Access, and I fell in love, which is, I guess, the good and the bad of the job is when they bring these pets in that are up for adoption as I end up taking them home with me. Uh, Zara is uh, the one you see there. I thought she was Border Collie, but I'm one of those pet obsessive parents that had to find out what her DNA was, and now I found out she's everything but Border Collie. <laughs> <laughs> she's a mix of like 10 different breeds, and then recently I adopted another uh, little, little puppy called Obi. My son named him for Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And uh, big Star Wars fans in my house. And he is, as you would expect, an L.A. dog, part Chihuahua. <laughs> Chihuahua, Terrier, Spaniel, you name it. Uh, but I love my pets as much as, in some cases, my children. <laughs> you really do, I think. Of course, you love your children. You put them on a pedestal. But with your dogs, you know, they don't talk back to you. And they do everything you ask them to do. And they're always excited to see you when you come home. So... Um, I think this is why the pet industry is exploding, is that we all have this close connection with our pets. So I want our panelists to uh, talk about themselves, introduce themselves, and get this show going for you. And we are going to have a, a 15 to 20 minute Q&A at the end, so everybody gets a chance to participate. If you have questions, these are your experts. I know I have a lot of questions about pet food and what to be feeding my pets, the new trends, because a lot of the trends that you're seeing for humans, you're also seeing for our pets. and that category is exploding, whether it's CBD for pets now, hemp products. I mean, we're gonna go there. So Billy, go ahead, you get us All started. All right, thank you, Natalie. Uh, hey everyone, good morning. My name is Billy Bishop. Uh, really honored to be here uh, with this great panel uh, to talk about really the power of pets. Uh, they are such a part of our family. They've always been for me. 
Uh, I know that picture was only taken last week, not really, uh, but uh, a few years ago, that actually uh, is our founder of Blue Buffalo, that is Blue himself, uh, a few days after we brought him home, uh, and he's just played a major part in our, in our lives, uh, and truly is the founder of Blue Buffalo. Uh, he had several bouts of cancer at a young age, uh, and that always got us thinking about why, uh, and that really turned us on into, into looking a little bit closer uh, to the pet food uh, industry and pet food marketplace. Uh, again, being pet parents, not knowing much about pet food back in the early 2000s, uh, he gave us the reason, uh, the reason to do that. Um, so I'm excited to be here today and uh, be, again, be with this panel and answer any questions that you may have. But uh, pets truly are family members and, and I think everyone today is, is, is thinking that way. And so my mission is, uh, is being involved in Blue Buffalo and now with General Mills is how do we continue to feed our pets like family? High quality, natural ingredients uh, that deliver the nutrition that pets need, regardless of age, regardless of, uh, of size, uh, and regardless, regardless of special needs. So it's, it's truly a, an honor to be in this role, and uh, we take it very seriously, uh, and we continuously want to improve and do our best to make sure that our furry family members get what they need uh, to have a happy uh, and healthy life. So again, thank you for all, all being here. Annie? Great, thanks, Natalie. Yeah, happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, so that's my Gidget. She's a rescue pup. I have not had her DNA tested, but um, <laughs> she's about 35 pounds, really muscular, kind of compact, and every person says, oh, can I pet your pocket pity? <laughs> so we're just gonna go with the consensus that she's a pity. Um, she's the most affectionate dog I've ever had. She will not only hold a gaze, she will seek out your eyes. When you are petting her, she's like, this is good, but I wanna see your eyes. Let's look in your, I wanna look in your eyes. Um, so incredibly affectionate. Um, I have the pleasure of leading the nation's leading charity, registering you and your pets to be therapy animal teams to visit people in your community in vulnerable situations. If you wanted to take your dog or your cat to the children's hospital, help a struggling reader visit somebody with dementia, you would come to Pet Partners and we would educate you, evaluate you and insure you and make sure that your pet enjoys the activity as much as you do. Um, for me, it brings together three things that I'm passionate about. That's volunteerism, human health, and pets. So it's a wonderful way to make a difference in your community while strengthening the bond that you have with your pet as well. Happy to be here. All right. Bob? Well, Bob Viteri, I'm the uh, recently retired president of the American Pet Products Association. Uh, we put on Global Pet Expo every year, which is uh, the largest annual pet product show in the world. It, uh, encompasses almost a million square feet in the entire Orlando Convention Center, and you do get to see some really interesting products as you uh, wander the, the floors, which I'm sure we'll mention a little bit later. Uh, you see me with Dakota. Uh, my whole married life, we've had golden retrievers to the point where our carpeting now matches the golden retrievers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Much, much easier than vacuuming all the time, although I still think we can make pillows out of his hair, but <laughs> another story. There's an industry for that too, <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Yes, there is. <laughs> In fact, we aren't this song. Um, Dakota passed away a couple of years ago. Aww. It's 15 years old. We were all set to go get another golden retriever when my son, uh, we inherited his cat because the cat didn't get along with his two dogs. Never having been a cat person, I never expected the cat to sleep on my head and be the <laughs> most affectionate thing in the world. So Mr. Pepper is now the newest member of the household. <laughs> we're sending him in school to become Dr. Pepper. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, old, old joke, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but even though I'm retired from APPA, I'm still uh, the president of the Human Animal Bond Research Institute, which spends all of its time studying the human health benefits mm -hmm. that could be derived from having a pet. And I've uncovered so far over 30,000 studies showing how it does everything from working with autistic children, PTSD soldiers, uh, kids with, with uh, trauma, just all sorts of benefits that are slowly but surely becoming ingrained in all of us. So again, I'm really grateful that you folks invited me to be a part of this. I think this is an excellent program and, and I'm glad to answer any questions and be a part of it. I love that perspective and we're gonna dive into that as well, how pets are our therapy and Annie certainly has a lot of experience and can talk about that as well. But let me start with you, Bob, because let's talk about this industry that has exploded. I mean. In 2018, it was a $72 billion industry. By 2025, they're expecting it to exceed and surpass $200 billion. And when you talk about what we see in terms of, and of course we look at our animals as family members now, but is this a global trend as well? I mean, I feel like 
The U.S. certainly leads that, and we take our dogs and our cats everywhere we possibly can, but is this something that we're also seeing globally? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. uh, Natalie, when I first started in 2002, the pet industry was a $20 billion industry. Mm -hmm. Food is bigger than that now all by itself, you know, the services and everything. But we are finding that slowly but surely the rest of the globe is, is following us. It's because it's become such a humanization trend, because that's no longer like I think we're humanizing pets. It's like that's a given where we go is beyond that. And, you know, Great Britain and, and much of Europe is, is right there. And now you're finding that Asia, where before they never really looked at, at animals mm -hmm. as pets, that is absolutely catching up quickly. So, you know, you talk about the, the U.S. market being $200 billion. They're saying by 2025 the global market could be close to half a trillion dollars. Gosh. Wow, good time to be in this. <laughs> you guys timed it right. Let me ask all of you here, how many of you, first of all, are pet owners, I imagine being here, wanting to be right. part of this. It's kind of, you know, you'd expect that. But how many of you, like I do, let your pets take over your bed? And when I mean take over, they move in. Yes, they sleep on the bed. I don't care about my furniture. Mine are right there, sometimes with my child in the bed, too. So it's, okay. it's like a family party in the bed. Yes. <laughs> uh, how about how many of you have made major purchases with your pets in mind? Show of hands. Just about everybody in this room again. And how many of you want a pet airline that you can travel with? That's me. <laughs> yes. Right, guys? I was saying before they came in, like, please tell me somebody is going to make this happen. And Bob said, well, Pet Air tried this. 10 years ago, maybe right. too soon? Yep, maybe it's time soon. to circle back. It will happen, <laughs> I, I guarantee you. The, the demand is there. I want my pet to go with me, my pets to go with me everywhere. And the same way I want to share in these experiences coming to Aspen with my children, you also want to be able to experience mm -hmm. them. I mean, what better place than a place like this to let them roam free and run in the meadows here? Um, Billy, let's talk about what you founded. And, and you, you brought up, of course, you know, why you thought the importance of organic food and, and how important it is for humans, but you realized, okay, well, this is something for our pets as well. And with Blue Buffalo, your own dog, you mentioned bouts of cancer. Sure. And, and where are we seeing the trends? I mean, I see organic pet products everywhere, but are organics as important for our pets as they are for humans? Yeah, I think it's back to wholesome natural yeah. ingredients. I mean, that, that really is the foundational key. Um, so I don't know how many of you all have read a pet food label before. Uh, I am embarrassed to say we didn't early on. Uh, uh, and that's really what got us into this business. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, again, er every pet food out in the marketplace meets the nutritional requirements. Uh, our opinion is we just choose to use a different set of ingredients, ones that we feel are, are wholesome and natural, uh, starting off with, with meat as the first ingredient. You know, our cats and dogs thrive on protein. If you're going to have a grain base, why not go wholesome whole grains, uh, mm -hmm. barley, oatmeal, um, you know, brown rice, those types of ingredients. And fruits and vegetables are actually okay uh, for pets uh, to give mm -hmm. you the key antioxidants and nutrients that they need to really thrive. Uh, so for us, it really was an, an eye-opener. Uh, again, this goes back to the early 2000s, roughly around 2002, uh, where we saw some, uh, some emerging natural products starting, but nothing really yeah. widely available. Uh, and so that really, we thought, was our opportunity. I never made a lick of pet food uh, in until we got into this business, and uh, really, it's been an amazing, an amazing experience. And, you, and when you talk to pet parents, I think that's really where you, you know, really where you yeah. get that reassurance, and you, and you understand how how happy they are in feeding wholesome natural and the benefits that they see in their dogs and cats. So, again, it gets back to that core set of wholesome natural ingredients that uh, that we choose to use, and other natural uh, foods are using that. I really think is driving the growth, or I know is driving the growth uh, within the pet food market. And I know a lot of our pet parents are going to have questions about what I should be feeding my my dog or cat. Because I am confused. When I walk down that pet aisle, it's getting bigger and bigger, and you see everything from grain-free, everything is the primal diet. When it comes to that, I mean, I, I for a while was on the regular, you know, blue buffalo, sure. which both my dogs do. Then I went grain-free for sure. a bit because everybody said, oh, it's better for your pet. But then my veterinarian said, actually, they've done studies, they've done research, and it shows that that can be a stressor, a cardio stressor for your older pets especially. So then now I'm back to what they used to eat before. Mm. So what is the research? What do the studies show? Yeah, you know, uh, people are still uh, are learning. Uh, yeah. But I would say, again, it gets back to the fundamental uh, guaranteed analysis uh, nutritional requirements mm -hmm. uh, that every pet food has to, has to live up to. Uh, there has been an emergence of a lot of grain-free diets today, and uh, I know that uh, the FDA and people are looking at that right now to see if, you know, if there are any potential uh, causes uh, of that particular diet type. We have not mm -hmm. known any that are specific to that grain-free diet, even though I know there's some studies going on. 
uh, tend, tend to be older dogs that have that, uh, that issue yeah. that you're talking about uh, and, large breed, and large breed dogs. Maybe that's why. Um, but yeah. you, know, you, need a, you need a host yeah. of animal nutritionists, uh, and, uh, and we have those. Uh, we work with veterinarians as well, uh, so we really make sure that we have the right nutrition built for the right, the right dog. And again, you have different mm -hmm. sizes, you have different energy requirements. Cats sometimes need special solution diets, whether they have hairball issues, uh, urinary tract issues. Uh, yeah. So we work with you know, our PhD nutritionists to make sure that we have those right recipes within our total Blue Buffalo product portfolio to really meet, hopefully, your pet's specific needs. And there are breed-specific brands, in fact, as well. Right, Bob? Yep. Talk about you're that. finding, you know, for Golden Retrievers, you'll have one whole set. And even within Golden Retrievers, for the young version, for the older version, for the senior version. As Does it hips, make a difference? <laughs> uh, yeah, I got to admit, with the hips especially, I found yeah. that there was some uh, product that we went through that made a big difference in his ability to walk around. I mean, he was a 105-pound lap dog, or at least in his yeah. mind he was. Yeah. Um, but it made a difference. It made him a lot more mobile. So uh, we became Blue Buffalo users. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> and, and he definitely benefited from it. But it is so specific yeah. to every single type of dog or type of need. And it's interesting because you, know, you talk about the seniors. Just like our seniors, you know, as we get older, we think about our hips and our joints. I mean, I was, I'm getting my now eight-year-old dog, you know, glucosamine chondroitin right. or any kind of like right. fish oil. So that's an area where you all are seeing seeing that, that expand as well, that industry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you look at our senior diets, they all have glucosamine yeah. and chondroitin in them to help you know, with, uh, with the joints. Omegas play a big role. Omega fatty acids play a big role only in skin health uh, and coat quality. Uh, so yeah, I mean, again, the humanization trend uh, is really happening in transferring to pets, and uh, there are great formulas that meet those, uh, those needs. It's just a matter of time before they really sit at the table with us, That's right? It. That's <laughs> it. That's it. <laughs> they pretty much have. They do, right? <laughs> they kind of do. Exactly. They're, they're under the table, but pretty soon they're going to be sitting in their own chairs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, Annie, let's talk about our pets as therapy because I firsthand, I mean, I, I see so many stories of this. The Today Show has adopted since Charlie, our very first pet puppy who became then our therapy dog um, on the plaza and then has now gone from veterans to seeing eye dogs. We've, we've had a, like three different dogs, I think, through this course. Um, but we know the importance of, you know, in my own house, like my, my, the minute I come home, those dogs they can tell, they can mm -hmm. sense if I've had a good or bad day, and they know exactly how to greet me at the door. Uh, so like I said, something my children don't even know how to do. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Talk to us about how much research and how much evidence we really see that animals as therapy and, and the, the connection that we have to them has really blossomed into something where we see the, the health benefits for mm -hmm. ourselves as well as for them. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the science is really just catching up to everything we all know is true, right? We all know that we feel better around our pets. Um, in our organization, you know, we lose thousands of volunteers a year on the animal end of the leash that they just die too young. And I always say if our love were enough to keep them alive, they'd live forever. Um, but they don't live forever. Uh, but the time that we have with them, the benefits that we get out of them on the human end of the leash, you know, they're just tremendous. You know, at a very basic level, um, people who own dogs walk more than people who don't. Yeah. Okay, we can all agree that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, some of the early research, and the field's only a couple of decades old, and as a body of science, it's called Animal Assisted Interventions. So in the world of AAI, some of the early research was around blood pressure, something easy to me me measure. Right, you pet your dog, your blood pressure goes down. Mm -hmm. Or your cat, right? You pet your cat, your blood pressure goes down. So that, that was great research early on. And then it started to go beyond that. When I talk about uh, my dog like seeking out a gaze, when we're looking into each other's eyes, we're both feeling a release of oxytocin, you know, the love hormone, mm -hmm. right? So that feels good. We know that oxytocin battles depression and anxiety. Um, so having that pet that you come home to every night and you know, it's like kind of all the joy of dating and marriage without <laughs> some of the hassle, right? You got your dog to release the oxytocin. Um, but it's the same thing, too, that how mothers bond to their babies. That's oxytocin, yeah. and that's part of why we feel the bond with our animals. Um, some of the more recent research has sort of gone beyond that. Uh, recent research around children who are struggling to learn to read will make greater gains in proficiency reading to an animal than through traditional reading specialist intervention methods. Hmm. The children are like, the animal's not judging me, they're more likely to try to sound out the word, and they're more willing to read for longer. That's great. So that's wow. a really recent sort of discovery around what they're doing for struggling readers. 
Another really big area of importance is um, on the service animal side, right? So a service animal one-to-one -one relationship, that animal performs a task for that person. Guide dog, hearing assistance dog, may pick up things. Therapy animal one-to-many. So it's you sharing your pet with many people. So on the service animal side of it, a lot of great work funded by Habery, coming out of Purdue University and Maggie O'Hare around veterans with PTSD mm -hmm. and what a service animal can do for our returning veterans. So that's really a space to watch. <coughs> Yeah, it's remarkable to see that connection. I've, I, you know, I see that a lot, especially when you travel around the country and you see, you know, a veteran with a dog, yeah. and you know that that relationship is is a relationship that is based on such respect too. Our animals respect us; yeah. we respect them back in the same way. Um, what about new ways that pets are being used for rehabilitation? Mm -hmm. You know, it, increasingly there's a chance you might go into your physical therapy office or a psychologist's office and find that they're using their own animal as part of their practice. So a lot of the work historically has been volunteers, people sharing with their animal as a volunteer, but now it's moving into that professional space where people are recognizing, and now there's finally enough science mm -hmm. to sort of support why someone may have um, an animal as part of your clinical care or, or your treatment protocol. So that's an area. Um, another area where you're sadly more likely to hear and see about therapy dogs is in crisis situations. Yeah. And we're unfortunately um, experiencing way too many crises. But you'll hear stories about children returning to school after a school shooting, and there'll be therapy dogs there, and the kids will say, the only thing that helped me cross the threshold and allowed me to return to school is that there were therapy dogs there at the mm. school. Um, so that's an unfortunate area, but yeah. a very important area where therapy animals are playing a role. And then maybe on a more uh, lighthearted side, um, workplace well-being for companies that don't want to be pet friendly all the time. Uh, bringing therapy animals in as a de-stressor and a de-stress event is becoming a workplace perk or a well-being offering. And we've had a partnership uh, with Aetna and they would survey their employees um, after the therapy animals came in. And our favorite one that they shared with us is they had someone who said, this is my favorite benefit that Aetna offers. <laughs> and the gal who was running the program said, more than your 401k plan? Because <laughs> we could save a lot of money. <laughs> I was going to say, would we all stay at work longer if our pets right. were there with us? Because yeah. then you don't have to worry about getting home to walk the dog. You can spend your day at, the, at working Absolutely. if you knew that they were right there with you the yeah. whole time. I think you'd feel better about what, what is my dog doing right yeah. now. And they build community, right? Yeah. People in the workplace are more likely to come in and interact and talk with each other as well as the impact on blood pressure and oxytocin. Yeah. Yeah. We all, such great benefits all around. Um, let's talk about some of the trends that we're seeing in the pet industry um, because everything that you see, as I mentioned, for us humans, we're seeing now for our pets. Um, I think one of the biggest that I've noticed recently as I shop for my pets a lot is besides all the toys and gadgets that they now need to have, <laughs> it's kind of like the baby aisle, um, <laughs> the CBD mm -hmm. impact and hemp infused products. Bob, you want to talk about that? Is, is there real science and research? I know there's the science and research for humans is still being, you know, is in the works, but what about for pets? No, it, it, more and more of that research is going on right now. Yeah. I was uh, telling uh, Billy before, at our trade show this year, 75 different companies are showing CBD product, uh, products that contain CBD. Uh, the, the early returns are, yes, it's helpful in a lot of situations. Obviously, you know, they're trying to make it a blanket cure-all, yeah. but I think the science is backing up the fact that this is going to become a growing trend. You know, and like you said, any trend you see in human products, I'll guarantee you within two to three months, you're going to see that in the pet side. It's just getting yeah. closer and closer to being, if it works for a person, it's got to work for a pet. That, that's one in particular that, that's having a lot of stamina. Anything now, because pets are becoming so important to our well-being and our health, mm -hmm. anything that keeps your pet healthy and alive longer and stronger has become critical. I mean, if my pet's making me feel good every day, I want him here all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. Let my dog live to be 35. That would be fine. I, 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 could, I could do that. So uh, those products are becoming more and more tested and more and more uh, credible now. And within foods, you're seeing it. You know, the Food Buffalo's done it. A lot of the other companies are adding those types of things so that senior-specific products and, and uh, overweight, obese pro products for obese pets and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. all to try and help those pets stay healthy longer. 
what are you saying, Billy? Yeah, are, no. are you guys making a CBD food that I should know about? <laughs> not yet. Not yet, um, not yet but yeah, I'm sure it's no, it, it is. I mean, again, I, the humanization, uh, you know, is, is real, uh, yeah. and, and it is being uh, being passed down to our pets. And um, uh, you know, we're constantly hearing of, of new innovation. But you know, Bob's show is the is the spot to see where that innovation happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to make sure uh, that we are delivering as best we can. You know, the, the healthiest products for our pets to thrive. Uh, in every life stage, uh, you know, from puppies to adulthood to seniors, uh, we just want to give them an opportunity to, you know, to continue to to be active family members. Um, mm -hmm. So for us, again, it's it, it, the foundation for Blue Buffalo is the wholesome natural ingredients, and how do we make sure that we can uh, can formulate products for all life stages and breed sizes and needs? And who knows? Someday, I think there, you know, there could be some <clears throat> natural supplements that could be great for anxiety, for instance, yes. or for mm -hmm. additional right. joint uh, joint issues if dogs have uh, chronic joint pain. Uh, that CBD yeah. may, be, may be able to play a role in but we're constantly looking at, uh, at ways to uh, do that. I think what's interesting is um, the same way we all have our smartwatches or our mm. trackers that we use for our pet, for, our, for ourselves to track our, our number of steps per day, you see our animals are having these as well, right? There, I know there are a couple different companies that have done this as well, and it's a way for us to make sure that they're getting the right amount of exercise. So when it comes to exercise, how much exercise, and I guess it depends on breed, sure. do your pets really need, Bob? Well, there are we have a company that has a, a treadmill for your dog in case, in case you don't want to go outside and take your dog for a walk. Who has that at home already? It's Pup -ton, it's a whole new thing? Not yet. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's actually to allow a person who's otherwise handicapped and can't take the dog mm. for a walk. There's a way you can keep the dog going for a walk right there. But there's so much more now for tracking that. There's different types of devices to, you know, even you were mentioning it would be nice to bring your dog to work. We had a guy who had seven cameras in his house that were all connected to his computer, <laughs> and every one of those cameras walked the dog, and the dog had a phone around its collar. A so phone if the, around the collar. If the dog was doing something wrong, he could call the dog. It would answer. My dog would have had a heart attack. But this <laughs> I see what you're doing. Stop chewing my right. shoe. Basically, that's it. And you know, you could see the dog kind of looking like okay, this. Okay, that's a little extreme. Yeah, but like I said, our show's got, like Billy said, it's got it's it's everything you can exactly. imagine. Out but how many of you do have those cameras, admit it, at home? Uh -huh. And you watch your pets more than you watch your kids or anybody else in the house, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are they doing, the secret life of the pets. It's an yeah. NBC Universal there movie. You, you know, there's a reason these movies are popular. <laughs> we all want to know what they're doing at home. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what about entertainment? Is it true that if you put the TV on, do they actually? Sometimes my little dog seems to watch the TV. Don't you? I mean, have you guys seen this? Do they watch? They have videos for yeah. your cat, for your dog, for your whatever. It's supposed it, to keep them engaged. Oh my God! It, it goes well, on and on. It does. It does. But they're like we'll your children. Anything. You need right. to have toys for them. Right. Absolutely. Keep okay. their brains occupied. Uh, just to say with children, and, and uh, I'm president of a, of a board of a place called Green Chimneys. Green Chimneys is a school for special education kids between 5 and 17. But the difference of the school is, is in Brewster, New York, it's got a working farm. And on the mm -hmm. farm, it has everything from camels and emus and goats and wow. cows. And the kids work the farm. Mm -hmm. And most of the kids in that school are on the autism scale or, or other sorts of disabilities. To watch the difference, yeah. to watch a kid mm -hmm. go over and talk to the goat where he wouldn't talk to a person or, yeah. to, you know, to take me by the hand and say, these horses are well because I take care of the horses. I mean, to see that makes it you realize incredible. that everything you folks are talking about works. And, Annie, you were telling me a story about a dog in particular. You, if you have a favorite dog, there is, besides your own. Yeah. Tell, me, tell us about I that. Say, we have 13,000 therapy animal teams. I'm not supposed to have a favorite but I do. <laughs> so it's this uh, husky out of San Antonio, and he is a rescue dog, and they have pictures of when they rescued him. I've never seen an animal so downtrodden, matted, beaten, mange, just horrible. Oh. And the dog now is glorious, beautiful. And I always, I'm like, do you guys carry around a mini fan? It's like the, he's a Fabio of like therapy. <laughs> Gor just gorgeous dog. In fact, we're having a conference in San Antonio in September because I want to meet this dog. Um, but uh, one of the most heart-touching stories of all of our therapy animal teams, they were visiting at a domestic violence shelter, family shelter in San Antonio, and there was a little boy there who would not talk to anyone. And with the therapist's permission, the handler, Steve, shared the story of Bellin and how Bellin was abused and how he was rescued and now he's a therapy dog. And the little boy reached out, stroked Bellin's beautiful coat and said, it's okay, Bellin, I was hurt too. Mm -hmm. And that's wow. the first time he started talking and opened up to the therapist so he could start to heal. Mm -hmm. So 
That's incredible. what we do. And yeah. it's that connection right yes. there yes. that you see over and over and over again, which yep. is truly remarkable. All right, I want to give you guys an opportunity. I know you have questions for our panelists. So uh, there you go. Go ahead, sir. We're going to send a microphone your way. <clears throat> Ask to stand. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, the trend of con consolidation and M&A in the pet business, be it uh, you know you selling to uh, General Mills or mm -hmm. what Chewy has done with with mm -hmm. pets and and others, it seems like, and what Mars has done with uh, with veterinarian practices, it seems like it's actually become quite a big business. Obviously, Absolutely. given the, the volume of sales and stuff, but do you see that as something positive, having gone from being an entrepreneur to mm -hmm. being part of a large company? Yeah, I mean, I, I do in, in, in our personal uh, Blue Buffalo situation. Uh, from day one, uh, when I met with Jeff, uh, I, you know, we aligned on our strategy. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, when companies acquire other companies, uh, the acquirer has a different strategy than, uh, than, the, than the startup. Uh, but uh, what I love about General Mills, first and foremost, our values are the same, literally. I mean, uh, they're, they're serving, uh, serving our non as furry uh, family members uh, with, with high quality, you know, uh, natural products, the second largest natural and organic manufacturer here in the U.S. I mean, and that's what our mission is for Blue Buffalo, is how do we make sure that we give all of our furry family members the absolute best that we possibly can. So culture check, strategy check, uh, and then enabling us to continue to innovate. Uh, so excited to learn from what uh, capabilities General Mills has to, again, try to bring better, uh, better products to the market for, you know, for, our, for our pets. Um, it's hard for me to talk about other, uh, other companies just not knowing, but the pet industry, as we talked about before, is growing at a rapid, rapid rate. Um, the wholesome natural uh, category within the $28 billion U.S. pet food market is driving that growth. Uh, again, primarily through that humanization. So a lot of these uh, larger uh, global brands that don't have a portfolio of wholesome natural products that have built their portfolios on more uh, common grain-based um, based ingredients, now we're looking you know, to try to find wholesome natural alternatives. And sometimes it's easier for them to acquire than it is to, to build from the inside. And Bob, you want to add to that? I think about eight to 10 years ago, what you saw was pet companies, large pet companies acquiring smaller pet companies. What you're seeing now, and there's a perfect example of it, is human product companies uh, getting into the pet space by acquiring pet product companies. And I think that's, that's a, a pretty good trend right now that, that's uh, you know, going to go for a little bit longer because you know, it's the easiest way is to get somebody as credible as a blue buffalo to bring into your own credible uh, portfolio works forward. And you're starting to see that more and more happen now. But you don't give up you know, the, the identity of the company. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the same brand that it started out with the same intention. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Um, you just, you know, fed them food that you got from the grocery store. Sure. It could right. be, you know, just whatever brand. Um, but when I took my dog to the vet and we were trying to figure out the right food for her, he was like, well, there's only two brands that have not had some kind of lawsuit or issue or something ever. So I was shocked. I guess my question is, who's regulating dog food, pet food? Great question. Um, and what's going into it, and why don't we just feed them regular food? Hmm. Yeah, um, AFCO is the governing body uh, of pet food, uh, the American Feed uh, Control uh, Office. Um, uh, they're regulated on a state basis, and then they feed into the FDA. Um, but all of the pet food on the marketplace today has to meet uh, AFCO's nutritional guidelines or they can't sell. Uh, and they work with the FDA in deeming uh, what makes a healthy uh, nutritional um, pet food. And it can be designed by a bunch of different ingredients. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that's really what we learned uh, as we were starting out. Uh, again, you can make a very nutritious uh, pet food, and you can use a different set of ingredients to, to deliver that. Um, so uh, again, you know, I think in, in anything, as you, you know, as you develop food, even human food, there's the opportunity for recalls. Uh, and you do everything in your power to try to prevent that from happening. But if I told you today that we could promise you, you know, from here on out that we'll never have one, that's, yeah. just, not, that's just not true. Um, you know, especially in our environment with high meat content, salmonella is 
probably the number one risk, you know, just like with human food and, 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 and your frozen chicken or your raw chicken that you're working with or, or meat or what have you. Um, but uh, uh, we're constantly uh, getting better from a quality control standpoint. We have our own manufacturing facilities. We're continuing to, uh, to learn from General Mills. Uh, so um, uh, we only want to get better. Uh, and again, I think, uh, you know, at least in the last few years, a couple years, uh, you know, knock on wood, we're proud to say that we haven't had any recalls. Um, so. Yeah, sure. I mean, again, the, the internet is probably your easiest uh, your easiest ability to to, to learn a lot. Uh, veterinarians, we always encourage you to talk to the veterinarians. The veterinarians who we love and who uh, we're actually developing a natural therapeutic for uh, for veterinarians don't actually spend a lot of time on the nutritional side. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but I still uh, we still encourage you to obviously chat with your vet about about the diet that's right for your particular animal. Um, and then, really, uh, again, you should feel uh, assured that products on the marketplace today are held accountable to deliver nutrition that's required for pets at all life stage. If you read on the bags down below, the, somewhere on the package, they'll say that this meets the AFCO guidelines uh, for nutritional uh, development of, uh, of dogs and cats. Um, so for there, then it's just a preference of what you think is best for your animal. What's, um, what I was going to just say, because this is something that I've been doing a lot of research as well, because I had the same questions, especially when I got my little puppy versus you know the puppy food versus the adult food. When it comes, and going back to grain-free, now you see raw food mm -hmm. and the frozen raw. And actually, my, my puppy, I gave him a little bit of that once, and he threw up. Mm. So um, I guess that was his natural reaction, was like he was not ready for yeah. that. One thing yeah. to look for, guys, is complete and balanced. Uh, and, and that'll be a statement that, again, that'll be on most, uh, most of the um, packaging that's out there yeah. in the marketplace today. If it's not, uh, like raw, some raw diets, there are actually components that you have to blend together in mm -hmm. order to get a complete and balanced diet. So. Um, you know, again, I think you're going to have people that, uh, that 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 think differently that want to actually cook for their pets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, right? And, uh, and then figure out pet? the supplementation. Yeah. But she, 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 yeah, she's 13 years old. Yeah. And she was getting, she was usually eating organic, only you know. Yeah. But she started getting sick at everything that we mm. gave, so that we're cooking for her. Mm. Yeah. And she loves she loves that food, and she's not reacting to what we're giving. It's mostly turkey breast, sweet potatoes, carrots, mm. turmeric, mm. and yep. rice. Great. Yeah. And we yep. make patties, and she get it, and she get make some breads and so forth. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like that's right. There's. Work, but it <laughs> is. No, no, no. That's great. The same um, way you cook for your kids, yeah. right? Yeah. And a lot of those ingredients that you just mentioned are actually in a lot of the wholesome natural foods uh, today. And but at least we don't have preservatives. I think that I'm sometimes scared of the preservatives, like in processed food for humans. If sure. you read the label, mm -hmm. you get killed. Sure, absolutely. And again, most of those wholesome naturals will have uh, non-artificial uh, preservatives, right. so it'll be natural. I do cool. Thanks, Monique. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'd like to put in, I'd like to put in a plug for little furry things like yes. uh, mice and gerbils. We used to have gerbils when my kids were little because we weren't allowed to have dogs or cats in our apartment. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing cuter in this world than watching a father gerbil lining up his babies and teaching them how to open oh. a sunflower seed. Oh, how cute. Oh. It is I've so cute. <clears throat> but I think it is so important for kids yeah. to have these little pets. It teaches them responsibility. Absolutely. and empathy and sadly they don't live very long and so you go through the whole death thing and you have the the funeral mm -hmm. and it really broadens their mind and mm -hmm. makes them very compassionate people if i can jump in yeah, that we please. register 11 species as therapy animals and we register guinea pigs we register rabbits and it's mm -hmm. amazing when a child that has challenges controlling themselves um, whether it's just activity or mobility issues and you put that little guinea pig in their hand and suddenly they're quiet mm -hmm. and silent and capable of being calm. Um, so yeah, the little, a shout out for the little animals. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just, he, just to add to that, yeah, we actually work with a group called Pets in the Classroom and we're working with currently over 100,000 teachers around the country to have a gerbil, a hamster, whatever in the classroom. So the kids get That's to work right. with it, the kids get to see everything you just talked about. They get to see the transition between the animals and everything. So, oh my God, and they have to take them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is that side, yes. 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 You'll love them, trust me. You haven't lived until you clean out a gerbil cage. Yes, yes, yes. yes. 
<laughs> or a rabbit cage. I've done that. <laughs> OK. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I'd just like to put a plug in for an, an industry that I have nothing to do with. However, um, we started motorhoming a few, maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. And when we, the reason we did it is because we wanted to take our pets with us. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to know that they were safe and that we, you know, could still have them with us. And when we first started going, you saw a few pets in the parks. But now we look specifically for ones that have great dog parks and yeah. ones that have, you know, trails near. And I can't tell you, when you go to these parks now, it's like a completely different uh, from 10 years ago. They have activities for them. They have group um, pins for them. They have individual <laughs> pins for them. They have trails. And so that's one industry. And I think that the RV um, yeah. or recreational vehicle industry has really come around. I was, um, we just recently bought an, a new one. And I noticed that some of them had like pulley out dog pins and dog dishes in the motor mm. So that's how much this industry is Great. customizing yeah. for the sure. pet industry. Absolutely. Cool. You're seeing that everywhere. Yeah, go ahead. Um, related to the um, animal assisted um, interventions, is there research that shows that related to the oxytocin, the blood pressure, and the health with anxiety and depression, that cats are as good as dogs in? helping that, those yeah. things? You know, there's a lot more research about the dogs, so I don't want to overspeak um, on, on some of it. And I don't know if you know about any specific Cabri funding, uh, funding, funding studies, funded studies. Um, but we're not all dog people, right? I mean, let's be honest. Um, so I can't imagine, the science is catching up what we all know to be true. I can't believe it's also not going to be true with our cats mm -hmm. as well and the way we interact with our cats in our home. We actually yeah. did sponsor a study two years ago on cats and not finding the same, not quite to the same extent that you're getting with dogs because of the not as much interaction, but definitely mm -hmm. there is, a, there is a, an up, uptake in the, uh, the oxytocin. I've had cats that behave like dogs. Too. Yes. I mean, they, you know, the minute I come home, circling, meowing, it's like mommy's home. So I think yeah. we all have, if you have cats, you know too. I've got Bobby the be. cat now, same way. Yeah. Exactly. They're, yeah. They're, Comes they're, over, <laughs> wrestle them a little bit, it's Mr. good. Peppers, I think it's all what you put out there too. And yeah. sometimes it's what Absolutely. you give back to the animal. Energy. So, right? <laughs> it's always that. Yes. Um, I have a question for Billy. <laughs> <laughs> do you uh, does does your company do anything to give back to the animal rescue community um, for puppy mill stopping and so forth? Uh, we actually have two uh, uh, philanthropic efforts. Uh, the first is around pet cancer because mm -hmm. Blue had cancer, uh, so we started the Blue Buffalo Foundation for Cancer Research uh, when we started Blue Buffalo, uh, and I'm proud to say to date we've given over thirty million dollars back. Wow. Uh, to try to help find a cure, uh, both the universities that are, uh, that are doing studies, as well as to help pet parents pay for the high costs of, uh, of pet cancer treatment. So that's, that's our first and foremost uh, philanthropic give back. Um, second is we're actually working a lot now with uh, a new initiative uh, with some of our veterans uh, called Service Dogs for Heroes. Actually, the program is called Sierra Delta. Uh, and we actually worked with PetSmart, um, I think, last year. Uh, and actually we were able to raise a little over a million dollars, but it costs a lot of money to mm -hmm. get these specially trained um, dogs in particular mm -hmm. to really do the jobs uh, for our wounded warriors that come back, um, not only uh, mentally and socially to, re to rehabilitate into society, but literally to function, um, whether it's answering a phone or even you know, getting a credit card or answering the door. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've given monies there to help uh, find the right service dog to meet that veteran's specific need. And then we also do help sponsor uh, some shelters. Uh, so uh, the uh, um, Helen Woodward uh, Animal Foundation out in San Diego, for instance, uh, does an amazing job uh, in really trying to find these, these wonderful sheltered animals, uh, forever homes. And we try to do our best to help raise awareness uh, for what we call sheltered stars, because these animals are, are truly uh, wonderful animals and, and in need, uh, and in need of homes. So we do our best to try to, to give back through, through those three things. And I had never met Billy before today, but my organization is a recipient of their generosity and we are able to help take care of our therapy animals that are diagnosed with cancer. So uh, golden retrievers get cancer at a high rate. We have a lot of golden retrievers. So that dog that was visiting a child when they were getting their infusion therapy treatment in the oncology ward, that dog diagnosed with cancer, we can now help pay the, doc, the dog's medical bills because of their generosity. So mm -hmm. thanks. It's amazing. Yes. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if you guys would elaborate a bit on the CBD uh, dog with severe behavioral issues. So as I know that there was benefits for pain 
pain management. I was wondering if there's something my vet my vet says not to do it because there's no test. He's very conservative. I was curious, as professionals, what you think. Bob, maybe. What we're finding is probably about two years ago where, where we saw the first product come out. Come out. It was called Miawawana. <laughs> 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 they were scouts on it. They were, right. they were at, at our, our trade. Attention. They were at our trade show. The people selling the product wore big cat heads. In fact, I'm not sure they weren't using the product themselves. But yeah. but uh, they had some initial test results that were starting to show uh, if captured early enough uh, in the, with the pain around joints that they were starting to see it in cats. Uh, there's been since then several studies being done now, a couple of them were complete and are showing some indication with dogs. Uh, a lot more testing is going on right now. Nothing is saying no in the no. testing that's going on right now. Uh, if you have a conservative vet, he's going to tell you hold off a little bit. Uh, they're not seeing any negative impact no matter what, yeah. so I'm not going to tell you what, what to do or what not to do, but you know, at this point, I don't think your risk is as high as, as uh, it would be with some other methodologies. And actually, I did a... Um a report on the Stanley Brothers here in Colorado who have Charlotte's Web and you know they have a whole pet line and I think what's interesting I mean the same way Charlotte's Web was is founded it's a non-THC it's hemp based I mean it has like a 0.01 percent amount exactly. of the same thing is in their pet line so I think there's a difference between Miawana or whatever and something that has, they're actually doing the research right. to find, right. you know, the ability to use hemp based, probably hemp is, has been around since the 1800s, used to make rope and all of that. Um, so the question is the same thing that we're seeing with humans, the anti-anxiety, the sleep benefits, the anti-inflammatory benefits, I think that's where yeah. this industry is, is still ripe right. for growth and right. it's just right. exploding yeah. now, right? right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I have a question and a comment. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, and I was saying I have a question and a comment, and I'm from Los Angeles, and um, it's obviously there are such signs, but an interesting um, idea is that when you go to decide what you're going to do for entertainment or recreation mm -hmm. on the weekend, that there is so much focus on that for the pets. Yeah. So practically every weekend there is um, some, a meetup of a breed. Yeah. And there is, you know, if you go down to Huntington Beach, you'll see all the dogs surfing. <laughs> and, or you'll go to another park and they're having their agility competitions. Uh -huh. And last weekend there was one for the cutest dog in Los Angeles. You could come and all these adorable dogs and have their pictures taken and then they were going into a calendar. But there were so many things each weekend for the animals, which I thought yeah. was wonderful for people of all ages and so fun for the animals. My other question is, my dog is a therapy dog. We uh, joined and she um, was trained through Love on a Leash mm -hmm. and um, they were going more into senior and Alzheimer's homes. Mm -hmm. But my former background is, was a special education um, teacher and I really wanted to take my dog into the classroom and I wondered if you could just give some guidance as to how to get the dogs into the reading programs with the small children learning to read. Yeah, so we have a special initiative for our teams called Read With Me. Um, so a lot of it's just around education for you as the handler. The animal kind of knows what to do once you get in there. Mm -hmm. um, and the child's reading to the animal. A lot of the dogs just quite honestly fall asleep. It doesn't seem to deter the child at all. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> But we also have, we have, a, I was said, uh, we have a macaw in the program, and they're so smart. And the kids are convinced the bird's reading along. I mean, I'm convinced when I see videos that the macaw's <laughs> reading along with the kids. Um, with the school district, it can honestly be easier to find a local school district that's already letting animals in, because sometimes out of a lack of knowledge or fear of litigation, they'll put up that barrier, and it can be a heavy lift to get them to let you in. Um, but you can also start in libraries. You know, and look for other places, summer camps, other places where you might be able to do some literacy programming outside of the school district as well. Um, but yeah, it's a wonderful thing. And with this research coming out, you know, I wait, I'm expecting every reading specialist to get a dog to bring to, to work with mm -hmm. them because they're going to see a greater, grade, greater gains. Cool. Well, I think we, we've all touched on what you see is, for me, 
what we're doing for people, we are now doing with our pets, and our pets are becoming people, <laughs> I think is what ultimately, I mean, I think even just traveling here, you know, everybody seemed to have their dog on their laps on the plane. So this is happening more and more often. So to conclude, uh, maybe each of you can just give us a quick statement of where you think we'll be talking 10 years from now. What's next? What's on the horizon? Bob, let's start you'll, with you. You'll probably have at least two dogs sitting up here at the at part of the uh, They'll be talking the by then. They'll be talking by then to communicate. No, I think, again, the, the humanization trend is for real. The family member treating the pets as family members is real, and the way you would treat your kids is the way you're treating dogs. And that, that trend is so strong right now that that's just going to continue to go. Yeah. What I'd say I as the body of science grows, <clears throat> more acceptance by the true medical community yeah. that there can be a role for animals to play in your uh, recovery. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think it's really a cultural shift. I mean, I think people are just bringing their pets more and more into their lives. Uh, again, I agree with what, what the panel says here. They are family members. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we had an yeah. airline, right, that you could bring your, bring your yeah. pet on. So Wait I think they're just going to be more and more incorporated into our daily lives. At Blue Buffalo, we have dogs running around, and i got to tell you, it's great. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't uh, by any way dilute productivity. Um, so I think you're just going to have them incorporated in, uh, in multiple aspects of your life. So the that. power of pets, guys, it's amazing. Yep. The really power great. of pets. Yeah. Yep. Thank you all so much for coming out on this beautiful Thank you, day. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks to our panelists. <laughs> it's wonderful.